Amen. Thank you, choir. Thank you. Thank you for being here this evening. And good to be in God's house. The final night of our missions conference. It's been a great, great week. And boy, God has stirred my soul. And I hope he has yours. And so thankful and grateful to God for what he's done. And boy, God's been working on me all day. And I hope you can say the same. And the Holy Spirit of God takes his word that's been preached. And boy, just plows our row. Amen. And I'm so thankful for God's Word and the job it does. Visitors, thank you for being here tonight. Members, thank you for coming. And we're looking forward to what God has in store for us. Good to have Brother Byerly here. He's going to preach for us in a little while. And good to see Brother Wesley and Miss Sarah back there. And the baby. You got the baby with you? Amen. I want to see. I see, right? Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. My wife says, we're, we're not going to have any more babies. We're going to adopt the baby. Amen. Praise the Lord. And if we have one, it'll be through adoption. And uh, praise the Lord. Good to see you all with us. Brother Baker, good to see you tonight. I want you to come to the platform, if you will, and lead us in prayer. Ask God's blessing on the service. Brother David Smith, good to see you, my brother. We love you with all our heart. Just good to see you. Uh, Don't ever doubt that we don't love you. We love you. And pray for you. Think of you every day. Every day I read your name off every morning. And uh, I'm glad you're here. Glad you're here. Brother Baker, good to see you. Thank you for being with us tonight. You pray for us. Love Thank you. you, brother. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we're honored to be in the house of God tonight. To know that you're in the house is what makes it what it is. We thank you as the choir sang that you tasted death, Lord, for every man. And we don't believe you, you, you died just for a few, but for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, and we long for that day when peoples from all the tribes and nations and tongues and languages will one day gather before the throne of God and praise the precious Lamb of God who made our salvation possible. Pray that you'll bless this church now in its missions conference. We thank you for their good pastor and his family, and we pray, Lord, that you'll continue to bless him as he leads this ministry and preaches the word of God may you enable him and empower him and Lord may the best days of this church be yet ahead we pray for brother Byerly that you'll bless him as he preaches tonight as well we love you tonight Lord and we just can't praise you enough for what you've done in our own heart may we never forget the price that was paid at Calvary we'll praise you for what you do tonight in this service And in our hearts, in Jesus' name, amen. All right, let's get us a hymn book and turn to number 91. Number 91. What a day there will be. Uh, There is coming a day.
Fellas, come if you will, receive our offering tonight. We appreciate the opportunity we have to give. And everything in the plate tonight will go to our preacher and Brother Byerly. Thank God for him. And you know, I hear a lot of preachers talk about in-law, and I hear a lot of people talk about this too, some of you, about their in-laws. Boy, and I hear our assistant pastor talk about his in-laws. Amen. And uh, I can't tell any in-law jokes. I know some. I know some good ones. But I have good in-laws. I have no, no ax to grind with my I've had godly, uh, and he does too, by the way. And uh, just godly uh, in-laws, thank God for them. And likewise, as a new pastor, uh, I have a friend in John Byerly. If you only knew how many times that a pastor takes a church and the former pastor, and they never quite, never quite get, get where they need to be. But I can say one of the greatest friends I have in this world is your former pastor. And I thank God for him. He's been a friend to me. He's been a great friend to me, and I appreciate him. And I don't have any scary pastor stories to tell you uh, because he's been a good friend to me, and I appreciate it from the bottom of my heart. So let's give tonight and ask God to help you in your giving. Brother Dwayne, you lead us in prayer. Lord, we thank you for another time to come to your house tonight. Lord, and I just pray that you be with us without this evening, Lord. I pray that you'll be in the service. I pray that you'll be with Brother Byron when he speaks tonight. Lord, I pray that you'll fill him with your power, Lord. And Lord, I pray that you'll speak to our hearts, God. And just have your will and way in the service. Lord, I pray for some lost soul here tonight, God. I pray that this doesn't need his Lord and personal Savior. Lord, I pray that we'll get saved before it's turned too late. May the night be a night of salvation. Lord, I pray that you'll bless us all said and done here. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
you a choir. Let's all stand together, turn around and greet someone tonight. Let know you're glad they're in God's house. may be seated. Thank you so much for being here tonight, and uh, good to see you. My goodness, the teenage girls have taken over the front row. That's a good thing, amen. And Isaac said amen on that, yeah. <laughs> amen. Praise the Lord, and uh, hallelujah. They're trying to reach you out, buddy. <laughs> amen. He said he's not moving, amen. Uh, good to be in the Lord's house. I'm glad God saved us. I'm glad we can have fun together. You know what? And uh, this, li- this world's cruel <laughs> and unkind. And I'm glad we have a safe harbor to come here and worship together and fellowship with one another. It's such a beautiful thing. Thank God for it. And uh, Brother Joshua Wesley, uh, he and his wife and five children, missionaries in Jamaica, and uh, doing a great work for God, great work for God. And I'm thrilled to have him here tonight, and I want him to come and explain to us, uh, just give us basically an update, and we've talked a little bit about this, but I want him to update us on uh, where they are in the building process and what he's doing, uh, maybe with Brother Venable or things that he needs, and and say something about the ladies as well that made these things over here, please, Brother Wesley, and so glad to have you with us. Thank you. Well, it's really good being here. I just want to say thank you for everybody who's extended a hand of kindness, especially the Venables. They've let me and John graciously stay in their home. Anybody else who's done anything for us, we just say thank you publicly, and uh, we greatly appreciate it. Um, Pastor asked me to talk a little bit about the land. Before I get into that, um, there are some bracelets for ladies and some necklaces for young girls. My wife said, if I don't sell them all, i got to wear them home, so I don't want to wear them home. So, But uh, they are for sale over here if you are interested in anything like that. My wife made these. Uh, these. The funds from these will go to pay for our transmission. We just had to replace our transmission the Monday before I flew out. We repla- I replaced the transmission, so uh, it's going to pay for that. And uh, so pastor asked me to talk a little bit about the land. We were in a uh, 25 by 30 foot school, ro- school room uh, from the public high school, and uh, we've been meeting in that for almost five years now. And the time has come where we're beginning to grow out of it. Uh, it's beginning, beginning to get a little bit too squunched up in there and uh, have to have split services for the children and the adults. And the Lord has opened the door for us as we've been looking for about three and a half years now for property. But the Lord has begun to open some doors here recently where we have an opportunity to purchase a piece of property. It's about an acre of ground and it falls I would say about three or four hundred feet away from the public school that we currently meet in, so it's not a great change of location. It's right around the, right around the block, but uh, we're in dealings with the lady who owns it right now and uh, trying to, we've already negotiated a price. We're just waiting on the lawyer. 
I don't know if any of you ever had dealings with a lawyer, um, but uh, I've, I've had a few dealings with lawyers, but uh, they were quick. But Jamaican lawyers, for some reason, are really, really slow. It's taken her about three and a half months now to draw up a contract for a piece of land. So uh, you please pray for us about that. Uh, the second thing I, I would ask you to pray for about the property is uh, once we do get the land, pray that we'll be able to construct a building about the size of the, uh, of the classroom we currently meet in, just for temporary purposes, and then we'll move on with the, with the main auditorium. Uh, Brother Venable helped me out with some plans uh, for that today, and uh, it's just amazing to see what, what God can do. You know, uh, five years ago, there was nothing. There was no gospel preaching church there, and now we're looking at, at putting, putting down brick on, on soil and, and, and making a, a permanent dwelling place for our church. Right now, we just we meet. Sometimes we have to go in and clean up after the, the school kids, paint cuss words off the walls, and um, I'm looking forward to not having to do that anymore and uh, ha looking forward to just leaving the, the pews out and the chairs out and uh, being able to just come in and preach the gospel uh, to the people. So please pray for us about that. Um, and the lady's name that owns it is Miss Lee. Miss Lee. So please, please pray. Uh, maybe, maybe the Lord will burden her heart to, to give it to us at a, at a better, dis, better, uh, a better price. But uh, the church is, is doing well. We're doing well. The only thing I could say to pray for is pray that God gives us men. Um, the Bible says, I sought for men among them to stand in the gap and to make up the hedge. And in Jamaica, it is hard to find a good man. It is very hard to find a good man. We're teaming up with a, uh, a young man who's going through Bible college uh, as our assistant pastor. And uh, just pray for him uh, as we've asked him to pray about it. We've asked him about the decision, but uh, hasn't given us a response yet. And so just pray for us. We partner with a, a, a local, a national pastor uh, to uh, fill in for us while we're gone, to take it over after we finally leave Jamaica. And uh, pray that we make the right decisions there. Thank you. Thank you, Brother Wesley. You've been much in prayer for uh, the needs of the building, and may we never take what we have here for granted and understand that uh, there are people meeting everywhere, and it's not the building. It's, uh, it's the gospel that's preached and the Spirit of the Lord upon a place, and we certainly want his hand on Brother Wesley and his family as well as Brother Patterson, and to thank God for these dear missionaries. We love them. And glad they're here tonight. And we'll have a dessert fellowship after the service. And Brother Patterson will share with us in there some more things. So uh, you want to sit and take time to fellowship with them, get to know them. And it want to be a blessing to them tonight. The ladies are going to sing. I believe it's all ladies. Yes, it is. Praise the Lord. Except Brother Jeff. Amen. You're not going to sing for us. Amen. And uh, you pray for them. Let's pray together. Ask God's blessing on the song. Have your Bibles ready. And Brother Byron will come as soon as they finish. And we'll hear him gladly. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for allowing us to be here. And Lord, in a, in a way, it saddens my heart to know that, that uh, this is the last night of our missions conference. And, and uh, Brother Patterson and his family will go their separate ways. Brother Wesley and John will go their separate ways. But God, I pray that you'll do something lasting in our hearts tonight for worldwide missions. God, give us a vision for people dying without you. God, help us, please. I pray you bless this song now, Holy Spirit of God. Fill them and use them. Bless Brother Byron as he stands to break the bread of life. Fill him. Help him, I pray. Thank you for him. Bless now the remainder of this service. In Jesus' name, amen.
the blind made to see. I have never watched him raise the dead, but I know when he lifted me, there's a wonder right before my eyes, close enough to see. In my heart is where this one. see you tonight. Appreciate you coming and being in the service tonight. This is kind of like the uh, last night. It's like sitting on the backside of a mule riding it. It'll be over and or long. <laughs> You'll be glad the ride's over with. <clears throat> I was threatened by Brother Fredericks. I don't mind a rebel friend threatening me. He said there's a trap door under this, like it was going to scare me. I said, boy, you don't know nothing. <laughs> 32 years ago in three months, I walked through these doors for the first time. And the right above where I'm standing was the ugliest, biggest, I nickname it, but I cannot use the name in public <clears throat> that hung up. I mean, it was huge. What it was, the, 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 uh, the uh, speakers were in it. Big. I mean, it big and ugly. And it hung right above this podium right here. And the only way you could preach was to block it out because that fat thing was to come loose. If it had come loose... I'd have been three inches tall. <clears throat> really? <laughs> it was the ugliest thing I'd ever seen in my life. I think Roy was the one responsible for that. If it is, it's the first idea he ever had. I told Brother Clint, I remember when we took that thing down, I remember Jeff going up in there, and I believe with a ladder and taking some of those speakers out. I'm glad that thing's gone. That is <clears throat> the ugliest thing I'd ever seen. Just, so a trap door don't scare me, brother. Uh, he asked me, uh, the pastor did, and I appreciate him asking me to come to preach. And, uh, and um, he told me it was a missions conference. I don't do many missions conferences. Now, I'm all for missions, and I think you need me to push them. I told him I'd preached a few and only had one message. And could I preach it? It's just why I am a Calvinist.
I'd never gotten any result from preaching it. I don't know why. I'm, I'm lying. I'm not a Calvinist, okay? Some of you need to lighten up. You say you had some good preaching. Good preaching this week. Well, I'm glad. And uh, just have one night of disappointment. Good to see all you girls. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Boy, you got it made. <laughs> How do you rate it? Eleven girls and one boy. Why don't you boys get in on this? <laughs> Come on in, fellas. Jerry did this for years, right? When I was trying to do something, here he goes. Did you go too far? I have to turn around and come back there. Uh, good to have Brother Baker with us tonight. Appreciate him coming. Been a friend for a long time. And I know most of the folk here tonight. And uh, you that I don't know, that's okay. Hey, Connie. See <laughs> so who comes in next. <laughs> John 17. John 17. One verse. Only one verse of Scripture. And it does relate to missions. I... I believe that we're to be involved in missions. I believe that we have a mandate to do that. I'll say something about it in a few minutes. Verse number 18 of John 17. You know this to be the Lord's Prayer. He is praying and say, well, this is not the Lord's Prayer. Yes, this is probably the real Lord's Prayer. And he's praying uh, for his own, praying for his disciples. And, and in this verse, this verse, as he's talking to the Father, he, to me, makes mention of something that really is the mandate for missions, and I see it right here. I was at home. Somebody asked me, who was it, Jim Wilson? He smarted off at me when I come in. You're going you're gonna to give us a rerun? Well, I hurt my feelings. He never did listen when I preached before. <laughs> but now this is something new. I've not preached this before, not as such. But when I was reading this just a, a few weeks ago, I got to thinking about tonight, got to thinking about missions, and I got to thinking about the effort. And I appreciate the two men and the families that we have here that will involve themselves in a ministry such as that. And I believe in missions, and I'm glad that God is still using men, raising up men, and they're engaged, involved in that which God would have them to do. God has not quit. God is still doing the work, and we need to surrender and yield ourselves to Him. Verse 18. As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. What about missions? I think there's three things that be necessary for a church to be a New Testament church. Thing number one, you've got to have a pastor. I don't believe it's a New Testament church unless it has a pastor. And to be a New Testament church, and I know some of our uh, Baptist friends would disagree with me on this, but I believe that you need to have deacons. I believe that is biblical. And I do understand that maybe in some small churches, there's not the ability to find, maybe to find enough qualified men, but I believe it's right if it's going to be a New Testament church to have deacons, Amen. good godly deacons Amen. that understand what their responsibility is. And I believe that is a necessary component of a New Testament church. And I believe another component is a mission outreach. If it's to be a New Testament church, then I believe it's got to have some kind of outreach trying to reach those that do not know Jesus Christ as Savior. If we don't do that, why do we exist? Amen. What is the purpose of all this? Amen. I'm so thankful that 56 years ago that God saved me and he still saves. Amen. The theme in the song is Jesus saves, Jesus saves, and he still saves, and he wants to save, and he will save. Amen. So missions, I believe, is a viable part of any church. In this verse it says, as thou hast sent me. And I got to thinking about the word mission. What does it mean? It simply means the word sent. In other words, it's uh, God sends an individual to do a particular work. It is being sent. And I got to thinking about that. It says here, 
as thou hast sent me. Jesus was a missionary. He was sent into this world. And as I was thinking about that, the mission of our Lord, we cannot understand really what missions would be unless we understand what it is our Lord was sent to do. When our Lord came into this world, born in Bethlehem, politically this world was in a mess. Rome was the supreme power. The tentacles of Rome reached into every nation there around. Rome taxed nations. Rome was given to paganism. Rome did a lot of things that it should not do. And Israel, the people of God, they were under the iron heel of Rome when Jesus came. They felt the pressure. They didn't like it as Jews, as Israelites, pay, uh, paying taxes to Gentiles. I don't like paying taxes to anybody. But they didn't like that. They didn't want to be under the thumb of Rome. And here comes Jesus on the scene. And after 30 years, then he begins a public ministry. And understand something, Jesus had all power. He was the eternal son of God. He came as God incarnate. And he had power. He was omnipotent. He could do anything. It was he that created the worlds. It was he that flung the stars in space. It was he that made man. It was he that had all power. He could change anything and do anything. And the disciples thought, with all this political mess that's going on, he'll straighten it out. Politics is an awful word, isn't it? I'm gonna tell you something tonight, whether you know it or not, politics is not gonna straighten anything out. Amen. He could have straightened Rome out, but not one time do you find him mentioning anything about political wrongs. He said very little. He lived for 33 and a half years. He went to a cross and he died. He was buried. And on the third day, he arose. And then a few days later, from the Mount of Olives, he ascended back into heaven. And politically, when he went back, this world was in a worse mess than it was when he came. So that could not have been his mission. Do you understand what I'm saying? Now, I know this may be contrary to what what some of you are thinking. I'm just trying to get you to see what missions is all about. It's not about changing our political structure. Now, I believe in voting. I believe in doing anything you can to get things changed. I believe in morality. I believe in law. But I'm going to tell you that's not our main objective as missionaries in this world. It's not that. There was a lot of things wrong when he came. There's a lot of social ills when he came. There were things going on in Rome that should have not been going on. It was a very perverted time. A time that was a, there was a lot of immorality. It's always been that way. Homes were in trouble. Nations were in trouble. So much degradation. So much that was wrong. Now I believe we need to do everything we can to make sure that our nation is a moral nation. You know, there's a lot being said now about same-sex marriage. And I couldn't preach without at least bringing it up. There is no such thing as same-sex marriage. There has to be the potential to procreate before there can be a real marriage. Do you understand what I'm saying? I'm not saying that every woman can bear children. I'm just saying it takes a man and a woman to procreate. There is no such thing as same-sex marriage. There may be a same-sex union, but there's no such thing as a same-sex marriage. Well, we need to do what we can to stop it. We've tried, and evidently it appears that we have failed. But you know, Jesus Christ, he came into this world. He had all power, and he had all authority. He could do anything because he was God manifest in the flesh. He lived 33 and a half years. He died being crucified. He was placed in a grave, and on the third day he arose. A few days later, he went to the Mount of Olives, and he ascended back to heaven, and there were as many social ills when he left as there was when he came. That could not have been his mission in. If it was, he failed. That was not his purpose for coming. You know when Jesus Christ was born in this world, there was a religious mess. 
And I don't know what word to use except mess. It was a religious mess. And I'm not talking about just paganism or idolatry. I'm talking about the Jewish religion. That which had been given to Moses had been perverted until you could recognize it as the truth. It appeared to be a, an apostate religion. Religion was a mess when Jesus Christ came. I wish we could straighten out all the religions, but we're not going to do it. Religion has been a curse of this world forever. It has been. Jesus lived 33 and a half years. He went to a cross and he died. He was placed in a tomb and on the third day he arose. A few days later he went to the Mount of Olives. He ascended back to heaven and when he ascended back to heaven the religious mess was as big a religious mess as it had ever been. Do you understand what I'm saying? What does it say in that verse? As thou hast sent me into the world. All right, Lord, why did you come? You were sent, you were on a mission. What is it that was your mission? It seems that you have failed. You didn't accomplish anything. The world is as bad as it once was. That was not his mission. What was his mission? His mission was defined by a hill on the north end of Jerusalem. That hill we refer to as Golgotha. We call it Calvary. And it was on that hill, on the tree that we call a cross, and on that cross, they placed Jesus Christ. And they nailed him to that cross. They drove spikes in his hand and spikes in his feet. And he went to that cross and upon him was laid the iniquity of us all. That was the mission that he came for. He came to die for sinners. He came to give relief. He can do what politics cannot do. He can straighten out the civil matters or social matters when he gets the heart right. Missions is about taking the gospel of Jesus Christ and reaching into the hearts of men and men becoming transformed by the power of God, being transformed and made a new creature in Jesus Christ. That's what we need. As the Father hath sent me. The gospel will do wonders. I was thinking today, I still do that once in a while. <clears throat> I'm not real successful at it, but I tried. I listen to the news. Isn't it discouraging? Discouraging. We're in a mess. You say, well, the election's going to straighten it out. Are you crazy? It's not going to straighten it out. We got some real problems. Rand's on a tear. And I heard on the news late this afternoon that Russia now is going to send warplanes into the Gulf of Mexico for regular flights. It's a mess. Makes me mad. You say, what are you going to do? I want to shoot them out of the sky. You say, preacher, you ought not to be that way. I'm just like I've always been. I want, us, I want us to be the biggest and the baddest, don't you? But I got to thinking about something right before I came to church. If we'd spent half as much energy trying to reach the nations of the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ as with other things and men's heart would have been converted, there would be a change and we wouldn't be wrestling with this thing. The thing that will change this world is Jesus Christ, salvation, being born again, have your sins being washed away. It'll do more for you than anything else. As the Father has sent me into this world, there's purpose in that and it's Calvary. That's what it's all about. And I understand that we have to preach a lot of different things but the theme of our message must be the cross, must be his death, must be his resurrection. It is the gospel of Jesus Christ. It never gets old. It will still do the job. When everything else fails, it will still work and keep on working. I believe that, don't you? Well, the mission of our Lord then should help us to understand our mission because it says... Thou hast sent me into the world, even so I have also sent them into the world. What is our mission? We have missionaries here tonight that are foreign. I'm sure we have some here that are domestic, as far as homegrown for home. But everybody that's saved is a missionary. There's not one person that's saved by the grace of God that's excluded from this great privilege and this great honor of being a missionary. 
Well, what is our mission? Now, I'm getting to be an old man. I'm not an old man yet. Ronnie Grantham's old. I'm not old. But I'm getting there. And I have learned that there is value in that gospel message that supersedes anything else. Greater than psychology. Greater than anything. Greater than any power known to man. What is our mission? Our mission is a message. See, I don't go to the cross and die. He's already died. When he died on the cross, he, he was my sacrifice. He substituted. In other words, he took my place. He paid the price for me. He, he bore my sins. I cannot bear my sins. It would do no good for me to die on the cross for your sins. I cannot bear those sins. So what is my message? If you don't remember anything else I say tonight, I want you to remember this. Our message is his mission. Read that verse again. His mission was to come to this world and die on an old rugged cross. What is our message in? Our message is his mission. It's not hard to understand. Did you know that our message, well, listen to me, I know I'm going to get in trouble. Pastor, it's okay. I've been in trouble so many times it really doesn't make any difference. At this, at this point in time in life, who cares? <laughs> don't, don't take me wrong now. And if you do, that, will be all right. We don't care. Our message is not pol- politics. It's not politics. You say, well, which side do you own? I'm a fence straddler. I'm on both sides. Which side's right? Well, I know that there's some more right than others, but that's, that's not our message. By the way, I went and voted. Me and my wife, we went in the booth together. You say, why? Because she's not as smart as I am, and I had to instruct her. <laughs> she's seated at the back. She didn't hear me. But politics will never get the job done. We can spend all our time engaged in political. By the way, it's all right to be a little political. But that's not our primary message. Our primary message is his mission, what he did. In Romans, when Paul was writing to the believers at Rome, he said the message is the gospel of God. The gospel of God. What is that? He said, it's the power of God and the salvation to everyone that believeth. That's the message. It's the gospel. It is the power of God, not the political system. It is the power of God and the salvation to everyone that believeth. Anybody in this world. It doesn't matter what their political affiliation is. It doesn't matter what nation they're from. It doesn't matter what color they are. The gospel is. And it is the ability to save any and all that will come and call upon the name of Jesus Christ. Oh, what a sweet and wondrous name that is, the name that's above every name. God has given him a name, and it is above every name. What a wonderful, sweet name it is. Power in that name, power to change individual lives and power to change the direction of a nation. Paul said it's the gospel of God. Then when Paul was writing to the believers at Galatia, he said this message is the grace of God. The grace of God. What is the grace of God? The grace of God is wrapped up in Jesus Christ. How that in Him we have forgiveness of sins, but more than that, when we receive Christ as Savior, God imputes to us His righteousness. And he justifies us. He declares us right. And there is nothing in this world, nothing above this world, nothing below this world that can condemn us. We have been justified. That's the message. That's the message. What? What is our message? It's a message about his mission. I grew up in a preacher's home. I've been around preaching all my life, all my life, all my life. 
I cannot remember a period of time when I didn't go to church. Always went to church. I grew up around the best of preachers, I think. Most of the preachers, about all of those of the older days, they're gone. But I remember sometimes the, and by the way, I don't think that we all, the message ought to be so simple. I, I don't, don't, don't get me wrong. But I remember the simplicity of the gospel when it was preached and the impact it had on the lives of those that were unsaved. I long to see that again. Maybe, maybe we're not preaching it enough. Maybe we're not stating it enough. Maybe we have lost our message. Maybe we have forgotten the real mission of Jesus Christ when his father sent him into this world. Only, only the gospel of God, only the grace of God will do the work that we need to be done in the lives of other people. Roberta asked me before the service how many grandkids we have. You don't know? 23. Think I'm lying, don't you? I wish I was. 23 grandkids. 23. That's more fingers and toes I have. 23. Three great grandkids, eight kids, one wife, <laughs> and one really nice father and husband. Me. <laughs> 23, three, 26, 8, 34. There's two of us, 36, not counting the outlaws, in-laws, or what you call them. 23 grandkids. One of these days, very soon, I'm going to cross over to the other side. And I really, I'm ready to go. So you're afraid of death? No, I'm not afraid of death. I'm not afraid of death. I'm ready to go. But I think about those 23 grandkids. It's going to live somewhere forever and forever and forever and forever and forever. And if I understand the Bible, I think it's very simple. There's a heaven, there's a hell. If you don't go to heaven, then you go to hell. And hell I would not wish on my worst enemy. And the very thought is hard for me to comprehend how that something so innocent as those grandchildren could grow up one day and not know Jesus Christ as Savior and have come from my loins, basically, and, and spend an eternity in hell. I want somebody, somebody, everywhere they go, to preach the gospel, give that message out about the mission of Jesus Christ. When God sent his son in this world, what he longs to do in their heart, he can save them, and only he can do that. But he will do that. He will give the message. Amen. Amen. Mission of our Lord is thou hast sent me into the world. Our mission to give out that message, even so have I also sent them into the world. And I believe there's a mandate for all this that's stated right here. I believe it can be backed up by the book of Mark. Going to all the world and preach the gospel of every creature. Period. The message about his mission. It's simple. It's simple. We try to preach a salvation message. Now we complicate it so much until I sometimes get confused. Maybe I'm not saved. We have a way of complicating everything. Any old timers here, you remember when you got saved? It was just such a simple message. Jesus died on the cross for you. He was raised. And you just trust him and receive him as Savior. And I've lived with that for 56 years, believing that to be true. A simple message. A very clear message. A very precise message message. And you boys that are missionaries, there's one of them, what happened to the other one? Where's he at? Hello, brother. 
Preach Jesus. Preach Jesus. Nothing will excite you like seeing somebody saved. I like to get around a church for people to be saved. It's exciting. Exciting. There's not much going on out there. I hate to report it. I've been out a lot. <clears throat> I've been more busy this year than I have any year since I left. I've been busy. I've been out to Catholic Church two or three times. <laughs> Joel Osteen, he's contacted me, and I'm going to preach for him. <clears throat> been about to be around. I'm doing a lot of preaching for the boys that graduated from the college, from college. As a matter of fact, did last Sunday and two Sundays before that, I think it was one, Sunday before that wasn't, and Sunday before that I was. The revival had two revivals. The boys graduated from college. But basically, there's not a lot going on. And, and I know we can make excuses, but last days, I understand it's last days. I don't have any trouble with that because I believe it is the last days. I was getting ready to come to church and I had news on the TV and it got telling all this stuff is going on the Lord have mercy. And then they come up and they come up with Israel and the Palestinians, you know, they're in a big thing. Now this, this thing is, it's getting ready to explode in Israel. And the news commentator made this statement, said there's no one to broker peace. See how it is? He's called the Antichrist. Our nation has usually been the one to broker peace, and now nobody listened to us. I don't know why, but you know. <laughs> I got to thinking, I told my wife, I said, Good night. This thing's not going to last two more years. This thing is about over. I got really excited starting up to come to church. I thought Jesus might come, and I just stayed there at the house. <laughs> I'd like to. Go to heaven right out of that hole down there I live in. Every time I go to the house, honestly, we cut and go down my driveway. I say, honey, we're going back down in the hole. <laughs> but Jesus saves. And I hope you boys will preach it. I know the pastor here preaches it. Clint, he's not from around here. He's got to learn it yet. But <laughs> he's more interested in trap doors and things like that, you know. <laughs> But this is a missions conference, and I'm closing. We are all missionaries. Thank God He calls men, and they travel afar. They're to be commended. They're to be respected. They're to be admired. But it does not excuse you and me from our responsibility. Jesus came on a mission. Our message is about His mission. And we have a mandate, and we need to get at it. Amen? Amen. Amen. Well, it's like riding the back of a mule. It's over with. I think the preacher said something about it after a while. He, one time, I think he's changed his mind. He's going to have some international. He's in back to out of that hat, you? international desserts. I was thinking when he said that, well, this bunch don't know anything about international desserts. <laughs> they think it's something you go to an international truck place and buy something. <laughs> International. I, I like, I like, I like banana pudding. That's international food. Anywhere they grow bananas, they can make an, isn't that right? <laughs> I like pecan pie. Isn't that right? I like anything with chocolate on it. <laughs> hey, don't, don't, uh, chocolate, is that not derived from some kind of what is it? Is there some kind of bean or something? Help me out. I'm a little dumb tonight. Well, I don't have any in my backyard. So evidently, that is something international. I mean, it's wrong somewhere else. So if you brought anything chocolate, I'm for it. <laughs> hey, coconuts. I like coconut cake. Any of you like coconut cake? I know they grow coconuts in the United States. Down, don't they grow them down around Florida? Help me. I've been there, but I don't remember. Where'd they grow coconuts at? Folks, talk to me. 
Where do they grow coconuts? This is the dumbest bunch of people I've preached to in many a year. Don't even know where they grow coconuts. You say, well, you ought to know. No, I preach the Bible. You, say, yep, you carnal people know this other thing. But missions. Give, pray, and go. Father, help us, I pray. Take your simple fault and just make proper application with it. Lord, there's so much going on, so much to distract us. There's so much immorality and so much that needs to be changed. Lord, help us to understand that unless the heart is changed, evil will never be made right. Help us to be faithful in giving the message out. Lord, speak to hearts here. Lord, we, we grow slack. We're not seeing many people saved. As generally speaking, we, we find a lot of excuses. But I still believe that the gospel is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. I know, Lord, they've got to believe. How can they believe if they're not heard? And how are they going to hear unless we tell it? What you do, we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Pastor, if you would, mention come. Carl, if you would play, just play. Standy feet, would you do that, standy feet? If God's spoken to you, would you come? Bow your heads. I don't want you looking around. But if God's spoken to you, would you come? hard to have the compassion well to have it is for me there's so much twisted up in what wrong in this world well there's so many things to get us away from the mission so many things you know what? A lot of good things. But the best thing you can do in this world is share the good news of the gospel with someone else. And that's sometimes the last thing we do. It ought to bring conviction to our hearts to know that we can go a whole day, a whole week, and never tell one person. Something wrong with that. May God help us to get back to the mission. Miss Carla plays. Would you come? Would you come? If you're here tonight, you say, Pastor, I need, I need to do a better job. I need to do a better job of witnessing for the Lord. Pray for me. I failed in this area. I need to do a better job. Pray for me. Would you slip your hand? Let me pray for you. Thank you. Thank you. Pastor, in this area, I need to do better. Pray for me. Pray for me. How many of you have someone specific on your heart right now? You're praying for God to save. Would you raise your hand? Thank you. I want to ask you this question. How much have you told them? How much have you told them? How many times have you told them? God can save them. He has no problem with that. But we must go and tell them. We must go. We must go. Our message is his mission. That's the why he came. He came to save sinners. Paul said, of whom I'm chief. One old preacher said, if he can save the chief, he'll have no problem with the Indians. <laughs> May God help us to tell the story. Would you come as she plays? Father, again, we thank you for the message tonight. God, help us to get it out. There's nothing wrong with the message. 
still is real and sweet today. Because when I first heard it, God help us not to grow cold in the way. Help us to get the message out of your love for us. God help us, I pray. In Jesus' name. You may look this way. Thank you for being here tonight. and to remain standing, if you would. I have a couple of prayer requests I want to mention to you. Mary Beth Howe, uh, if you'll know, I, I made mention of them when they came in the other morning. Uh, how many of you remember that name that I called out in the morning? Um, they joined the church a while back. It's been a couple of years ago. Then they moved to Randleman, and then they moved back just a few weeks ago, and they came right back to church. And uh, she's in the hospital now at the, at the Women's Center in Greensboro. Uh, she's probably going to be there about three weeks. She's expecting. She's really, really early, and it's not good. And we need to pray uh, for her, Mary Beth, if you would. Pray for her and Mike, and uh, just pray for them. This Nancy Jessup went to the hospital today. I'm assuming she got to go home. Miss Sherry, do you, you think she went home? Where are you at? She was supposed to go home? Okay. And so pray for her. And lift her up in prayer, and that will be a blessing. Let me give you some instruction. Brother Barley, thank you for the message. We need it. Thank you so much. And I want to give you some instruction tonight. I want our missionaries to go ahead and come up. And Brother Joshua, if you'll stand right here. Brother Patterson and uh, your wife, you'll stand over here. And uh, we've been preparing this and praying over this. And want to want tonight show our love for these dear missionaries. And want to.